It is a good morning uh, because we've come to worship the Lord this morning. And that's why we're here. Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, uh, where we're going to continue our study. We started last week uh, in the book of Romans and actually continued last week in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And this morning, I'll begin reading at verse 3. Romans 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Every week when we open the Word of God, God's desire is to speak to your heart, whatever we're studying. And so let's first pray and ask that God would minister to us and teach us. Lord, uh, we yield ourselves to you this morning, and we want you to teach us through your Word uh, what we need to, to have this morning. Encourage our hearts, instruct us in your ways, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So last Sunday, we began the application section of the book of Romans. Uh, the first 11 chapters, basically, we could say are doctrine or theology. And now we shift into applying it to our lives. The first 11 chapters deal with the marvelous gospel of God and what it's done in our lives. Uh, and Paul says, on the basis of what God has done, the mercies of God, we are to, here it is, offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. That's God's great desire initially for us, uh, that we would offer ourselves, that we would yield ourselves. And that involves every area of our lives. And that we would offer ourselves for God's use. We saw in verse 2 that that involves not conforming to the pattern of this world. We identified the pattern of this world basically as a selfish, focused, self-focused pattern. And uh, so as believers, in, in, in offering ourselves to God, we focus not on the flesh, the pattern of this world, but we focus on yielding to the Spirit of God. And we discovered from chapter 2, verse 2, that when we do this, some marvelous things happen. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind by the Holy Spirit of God. And when we offer ourselves to him and serve him, we don't miss out on anything, but we gain in doing God's will. And Paul says God's will is good, it is pleasing, and it is perfect. Never forget that. God's will is always good. It is always pleasing, acceptable, and it is always perfect. Now, Paul is going to continue by telling us how we can have a part in the church and how if we offer ourselves to him, we can use something for him. You might be thinking, well, if I offer myself to God, who am I? I've got nothing to give him. But you do. You might not know it, but the moment that you trust in Jesus Christ, God gives every believer a means to bring him glory in the body of Christ. God gives that person a spiritual gift. This morning, we're going to lay the foundation in talking about what spiritual gifts are. And uh, 
we're also going to discover that in our study, we see what God's purpose for his church is. And so let's first identify a spiritual gift. We could say that <clears throat> spiritual gifts are God-given abilities uh, for serving and glorifying God. They're a means through which we can bring God glory. Now, there's three central or four central passages in the New Testament that talk about spiritual gifts. They're easy to remember. You don't even need to write it down. Just think of 12 and 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4, and 1 Peter chapter 4. And in those four places, you have the central teaching about spiritual gifts. Now, what I want to do is turn to some of those passages and end up in the book of Romans and give you some insight into what the Bible teaches about spiritual gifts. So let's turn to the longest passage that speaks about spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's just a few pages from Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now the Corinthian church had all sorts of problems. Uh, they lived in an area of the world similar to we live here around New York City. There were a lot of temptations, a lot of struggles, and they struggled with a lot of things. They were most, maybe we could say, the most worldly church. Paul's continually teaching and reprimanding them. And they were misusing all the spiritual gifts. So Paul takes three chapters to talk with them. Look at chapter 12, verse 1. Paul says, now about spiritual gifts, brothers... I do not want you to be ignorant. Just like the uh, believers at Corinth, God wants us to be uh, informed about what spiritual gifts are and not ignorant about their use. Look at verse 4. <clears throat> there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working. But the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Paul goes on to talk about some of the specific gifts. And then in verse 11 he says, All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. Now when we look over these verses, there's some principles that we need to identify initially about spiritual gifts. And uh, one of these principles is this, that the spiritual gifts are sovereignly given by God. He is the giver of the gifts. In other words, it's not a matter of our choosing to select a certain gift that maybe we want, but the gifts are given by God. And this is very clear. He gives them as he determines. And God has a purpose in giving a variety of gifts for his church. Second principle that we see is very important is every believer has a spiritual gift. Now, don't look at me that way. Who, me? You do. Now, you might not know what it is. I'm going to help you and give you some uh, information you can get uh, at the end so you can discover what your spiritual gift is. But the answer is yes. God has given everyone a gift whereby he can serve in the body of Christ. Every believer has a gift. Uh, it says in verse 7, to uh, each one the manifestation of the Spirit, and that's speaking about spiritual gifts, is given. And then it says, for the common good. He gives them to each one as he determines. A third important truth is that there are a variety of gifts. <clears throat> now, no one passage in the Bible or place lists all the gifts. And there might be probably more gifts than are even mentioned in the Bible. Uh, the gifts are a means for the church to be established and mature. And uh, some of the gifts perhaps probably were temporary while the church was being formed until the canon of Scripture was complete. But there's a number of gifts that are permanent. Let me mention just a few that the Bible mentions. For example, there's the gift of service. 
where we serve the Lord in different ways. A spiritual gift of teaching. There's a spiritual gift of encouragement. Yes, there is. Maybe you're an encourager and you like to encourage people and there's people that are gifted. There's a spiritual gift of giving. Now, before you say, I don't have that, um, certainly we all are to give, but some people have a spiritual gift of giving. It's maybe not just money and other things as well. Leadership, spiritual gift of showing mercy, spiritual gift of evangelism, uh, spiritual gift of pastor-teacher, administration is another gift that's mentioned, wisdom and knowledge, faith, discernment, hospitality, music, and craftsmanship. Now, uh, all these are means through which we can serve God in God gifting people for his purpose. And so uh, you have a gift in some way to serve God. Now, there's another uh, very important principle we see here, and it's this. The purpose of spiritual gifts is not to exalt individual people, but it's to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and to edify or build up the body of Christ. I want to read from 1 Corinthians 12 again, and it's a little long, but it's so powerful, this passage. As I read this passage, think, what is the main point that Paul is trying to make? Paul uses humor to make a point in an analogy between the physical body and the body of Christ. So look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. The body is made, body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, the body of Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But that as it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those weaker parts of the body, or those parts that seem to be weaker, are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So there would be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Wow, isn't that great? We should just read scripture. Uh, it's just so powerful, Paul's point here that he's making. And what you see is in looking at spiritual gifts, there's an underlying truth about God's church and how he feels about the church and his purpose for the church. And the purpose of spiritual gifts is to edify and build up the body of Christ. And you are the body of Christ and every one of you who has put their, her, his or her trust in Christ is a member of the body. And God's desire is that you would be built up. 
Just let me read from Ephesians. We're not going to turn to that passage. But look at, uh, listen to what Paul says uh, in the passage that Pastor Scott read earlier. Listen to these verses. God gives different gifts to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, he attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You know, what here underlies here is four uh, very important observations about God's purpose for his church. And the first is simply this, that the body of Christ is precious to God. In fact, there's several metaphors that uh, are given that illustrate uh, the body of Christ. One is the bride of Christ. We are his bride. We are his bride, and we're waiting for him to come. One day there's going to be a glorious wedding. We are going to meet him, and we are going to be involved in the marriage supper of the Lamb. We are his bride. We are precious to him. And as his bride, his desire is to make us blameless and to build us up. We are his family. That speaks a lot about what the church is, right? We are the family of God. We are his building, being built up to glorify him. And uh, the Bible says we are his body. We are the body of Christ. So it tells us that the body of Christ is precious. And what that means is, is that you are precious to God. A second observation is this, that every believer is part of his body and is important. No one is more important than someone else. No one is indispensable. It's a wonderful thing. Now, why would someone want to be an eye and not an ear? What would you rather be? Kind of a crazy question, right? Why would somebody rather be a hand than a foot? Well, feet are in your shoes. You don't have them out probably this morning. Maybe you have sandals. But they're, they're there. But you know, they're just as important as hands. And uh, your nose is just as important. It's different function. And the truth that Paul is conveying is we have different functions as believers in Christ, but we're all part of the same body. And all the functions move together for one purpose, and that purpose is to glorify God. What would the whole body be if it were an eye? You see, Paul's talking to the Corinthian church, and the problem was that everyone wanted the gift that was more noticeable. Paul's saying, what are you doing? God's the one who gives the gifts. You don't choose. And secondly, they're, no matter what the gift is, they're all important. No one is more important. And every believer is part of his body and is important. The third thing about the church is, is that we are to show love and concern for every member. If one part suffers, we all suffer. If one part uh, hurts, we all hurt. If one, one part rejoices, we all rejoice. You know why? Because we're, we're, we're part of the same body of Christ. So rather than react against different people and ability, we, we need to embrace that. The church is like nothing else. No other organization. It's not Republican, Democrat, Independent. The church is God's body here on earth. And his desire is that we would mature as believers, that we would be Christ-like, and we can't do that apart from his body. You know what it tells us? It tells us that we need one another. We need one another in order that we might grow. There's a fourth thing that it tells us, and it's very important about God's church, and it's this, that in God's family, he gets all the glory. He is the one who gets the glory. No one else is lifted up but him. Because all of our functions are different, but they all are for the same purpose, to build the body of Christ up and to glorify Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our desire. Now, from Corinthians, there's some other things that we could learn. And, uh, for example, spiritual gifts should bring unity, not division. Paul mentioned that in the verses that I read. It would bring in disunity in the church at Corinth. People were seeking specific gifts. He's saying, 
you know, your, your meetings, he says in chapter 14, are doing more harm than good. What he's saying is, is that what we need to do is uh, use our gifts in a gracious way for the body. They should not bring division. And then chapter 13 is sandwiched between those other two chapters, and all three of them deal with spiritual gifts. Now, you maybe thought chapter 13 was a wedding chapter because it's often read at weddings about love is patient, love is kind, but it's about spiritual gifts. That's the main focus, the context. And the gifts are to be used in love. It matters nothing to use your gift if you don't have love. And then he goes on to tell us what love is. It is patient. It is kind, right? It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not self-seeking. It is not rude. In that beautiful chapter. So we're to use our spiritual gifts in love. Uh, the last principle from Corinthians here that we just want to mention is that spiritual gifts do not make a person spiritual. What is a spiritual person anyway? Well, a spiritual person who is, who is a person who is focused on the, the Holy Spirit and not the flesh. It doesn't matter how many years you've known Christ. It doesn't mean, okay, if I know Christ for a long time and been a Christian, now I'm spiritual. Maturity takes time to develop, but you're spiritual, you're spiritual as you focus on the Spirit of God and offer yourself to Him and don't yield yourself to the flesh. That's what a spiritual person, and spiritual gifts don't make a person spiritual. Now, I know there's a lot of principles here, but what I want to do now is I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 before we conclude in Romans. Because in 1 Peter, there's something else Peter tells us about spiritual gifts that are very important. That is very important. 1 Peter chapter 4 Look at verse 10. Actually, look at verse 8 first. 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power for it ever and ever. Amen. Now, they're great verses. And it tells us something that we need to know, and it's this, that spiritual gifts are a channel through which God's grace can flow through you to other people. We are channels of God's grace, his unmerited favor. God doesn't need us, but he delights that we would do that. Did you see that in that first verse? Uh, that we are to uh, use whatever gift, we have been given, and that we are to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So you are a, a vessel through which God's grace, his favor, can flow to other people when you use the gift he has given you. Isn't that incredible? God wants us to convey that grace, that favor, in using our gifts to serve him. 1 Peter tells us something else. It tells us that we are to use and develop our spiritual gifts. You say, well, Pastor John, I don't even know what mine is. Hold off. We'll help you find it. But we are to use and develop them. If your gift, for example, is teaching, it doesn't mean that you can just stand up and teach without studying or going to school and understanding. You have to develop the gift that God has given. Same is true for the other gifts. Okay, uh, we are to use and develop our spiritual gifts that God has given. And Peter says, if your gift is speaking, you should do it with the very words of God. Now, he's not saying here that I should stand up and say, what I'm going to say this morning is from God. I don't know. That's just no, right? Only God knows. I'm human. 
What it means is, is I got to do it to the best of my abilities as unto the Lord. To seek to, to seek to do it the best I possible can. To be a vessel through which God would use. Now, whatever your gift is, that's the same thing. God intends that. If your gift is serving, then serve. Now, with that in your mind, let's go to Romans 4 and let's bring everything to a conclusion. Romans 12. Romans 12. See, we're back where we started. And now you won't forget the four central passages that deal with spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. And now you can understand why Paul says this in verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. In other words, we are to be humble. You know why? Because everything we have is from God. Everything. No pretense that we make that something we have is ours. In fact, every breath we take, the Bible says, is from God. Everything we have is God's. So we're to be humble. And so Paul says here, he says, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. There is a connection between us. Now you might say, Pastor, I just don't like you. That's okay. There's still a connection between us. And you know what that connection is? That connection is that we belong to one another. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we need to care for one another deeply. We need to really understand one another. We're here for one another because we're the body of Christ. And we want to build one another up. We want to encourage. We, want, we don't want to tear one another down. We want to build one another up. We want to encourage one another. And so Paul here says, if a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. In other words, this isn't just an ordinary job where we want to give our best, no matter what it is. What we're doing here is we're serving God. And so in using our gift, we want to do the best we possibly can, whatever the gift is. Whatever it is, if it's encouraging, let's encourage. And the underlying principle and truth in, the, in saying this that uh, Paul is, is, is mentioning is this. First, there's, there's some essential principles to remember in the big picture about spiritual gifts. The first is, is that God intends we serve in our area of giftedness. Now, this frees us up. Nothing is worse than if I asked you to preach and you didn't feel you could preach. You'd be a wreck all week. I don't like being in front of people. I don't care. you got to get up and do it. No. You can say no because maybe you're not gifted in that area, right? It would be a sad church if every Sunday morning everybody came up and preached. Nobody would be there to listen, right? And so whatever the gift is, God intends we serve in the area of giftedness. So if somebody says, I'd like you to sing in the choir, you can say no. Listen to my voice. I don't belong there. That's not my gift, right? But maybe you're gifted in some other area. You have a gift. God intends that we serve in the area of our giftedness. Now, if somebody says, uh, hey, we're having a get-together at the church. We're going to pick weeds. You can't say that's not my gift, right? All of our gift is to pick weeds, right? We're all here to serve. Right? But you can say no in areas where you're not gifted. Secondly, no believer has all the gifts. That's what God has done. There's nobody that's indispensable. Nobody has all the gifts. And that implies we need to work together. The church is not a, a whole bunch of individualists where we just go our own way. We need to function together. That sometimes makes things hard, right? But that's the way God has planned it. And then thirdly, it's easy to neglect our gifts. And that's underlying what Paul's saying here. It is possible to neglect your gifts. To go for years, even a lifetime, really with not using your gift. 
you know, it's not enough just to come on a Sunday morning occasionally or regularly to serve, worship God. You need to be involved in somewhere with the body of Christ to use your gift. There was a man in the Bible who neglected his gift. Does anybody know who he is? He was a good friend of, of Paul's. Paul actually wrote the last two books to him. You're still quiet. His name was Timothy. And you see, uh, as Paul was growing older, uh, Timothy was uh, um, pastoring a church, and he was discouraged. And so Paul writes in 1 Timothy, do not neglect your gift. Remember Paul said to him, take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent illnesses. He was having stomach problems. He wasn't having all sorts of problems. And then many teachers feel that Timothy actually dropped out of the ministry altogether. And the Apostle Paul in the last book that he ever wrote said to Timothy, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you. It's easy for those fires to go dim, isn't it? It's easy for us to get in a place where we're really not serving God. Last week I gave a little illustration about a goose, you know, who just went to enjoy and watched his flock fly by. Someone emailed me this week and said, I'm a goose. And I said, you know what, we're all a goose at times, right? We all fail to get involved. And so my encouragement to you this morning is not to beat you up, but to encourage you to fan into flame the gift that God has given you. Fan it into flame. Use it in the body of Christ. That's God's intent. You say, Pastor John, this is all fine and good, but I don't even know what my gift is. Well, I got good news for you. You can discover your spiritual gift. There's an eight-page handout that I have. They should have done this another way. I feel sorry for my secretary that we concluded Friday. I can't print uh, 2,000 eight-page copies of this. I got a couple hundred in the foyer. So you can take one in the foyer as you leave. It's eight pages. It defines some of the gifts. It'll tell you how to begin to discover your spiritual gift. But you can email my secretary, Linda Hanowitz. There's her email address, and she'll send that to you. Okay? And you can look that over and begin to discover your spiritual gift. God wants you to be a vessel through which he will extend his grace to other people. The world is saying, I'm too busy focusing on my own life. I got too many things. God is saying, no, there's nothing greater than being a vessel through which I can serve. God has gifted you, and we need to use our gifts. Isn't that great stuff from God's word? Tells us a whole lot. Let's stand as we close. <clears throat> Close your eyes with me. If you're here this morning and you've never come to a place in your life where you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, that's really the first step. All spiritual gifts, all the teaching this morning is for Christians. And the first step is that you need Jesus Christ because you're lost. And only Jesus is the way. Only Jesus can provide forgiveness. And so if you've never come to him this morning, you can do that right now. And you can say, Lord Jesus, right now, I ask you to be my Savior. I put my trust in you. I received a free gift of eternal life. Would you do that this morning? And how about as a believer, maybe you would cry out to God, God, help me to use my gifts to serve you. I offer myself to you as a living sacrifice. Would you just tell God that this morning? Help us, Lord, please. At the end of the service, there'll be people that will love to pray with you, and Pastor Jim Richmond is going to conclude with our benediction. Let's bow in prayer. Hear these meaningful words of benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior,
be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen and amen. So make sure you turn and smile at another member of the body of Christ around.